thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. And it's, it's wonderful to be at Strand. Um, Appreciate your presence here greatly. Uh, what are we doing, Uncle Joe? Well, I mean, I uh, the last time I s last time I saw Jonathan, um, I hadn't I hadn't read Scab Vendor yet. I I had uh, only read Narcissa, which was excuse the expression fucking great, <laughs> you know. Well, you know, you know Joe presented me last time I was in New York. We were filming with a documentary crew. They're making a documentary about me, and and we were up at uh, Joe's Joe's studio, one of his studios, and we were up there filming uh, an interview with Joe. They were filming an interview with Joe, and I was just sort of hanging out to lend a little support because Joe was uh, a little nervous that day. Nothing to do with the film crew, but he was just you know shell shocked from being Joe and. And yeah, so so I just happened to be there because usually I'm, I, I'm, I make a point of not being present when the crew is interviewing people about me because I don't really want to hear people talking about me. Uh, anyway, so after the interview, Joe like reaches in his pocket and he pulls out this little sort of miniature painting and it's a painting of me and it's basically dedicated to my other book, Narcissa, which is a strange book. I mean, I'm here to, I guess, hi, you know, pimp out this book, but Narcissa is a strange book in that, like, a lot of my closest friends and people that I really am close with, they could not read that book. Not all of them, but a lot of my friends, they, you know, and I, I think it's a really well-written book. So do I. And the critics think so, too. But for whatever reason, it's, it, it, it affected people. It's, it's kind of haunted, and it scared a lot of my, you know, very close friends. Jim Jarmusch couldn't read it. Couldn't read it. Couldn't get through it. He tore through this book in like two minutes, but he couldn't read Narcissa. He started reading, and he was just like, no, oh, I'm not reading that. And Eugene from Gogo Bordello, same thing. And on and on and on and on. A lot of my really closest brothers could not read that book because I guess it just hit too close to home for a lot of people. It bothered people. So my hat's off to Joe because he was, you know, the only one of my really close friends that read that book and got it and, like, got it so much that he went and did a fucking painting based on the book and showed yeah, me yeah, this it, thing. It, yeah, it, it, it moved me, you know, it meant a lot to me. Um, you know so much that that I you know I did this. It was it's a it's a triptych. It's a miniature triptych, and um, I painted over um, a, a Christian icon. Um, so, you know, un underneath the image of um, you know of of Jonathan, you know, is uh, is the the Virgin Mary with uh, with the baby Jesus. Yeah. But recently in um, in L.A. I had a retrospective, and I the the I don't know if if peop, how many of you I mean there's only a few people here that know that know my works. I mean it takes a long time to produce any one of my works. You know, even the, even these miniatures that I'm doing, you know, that's like six months, but it could take you know four years. It took eight years to do the big, you know, uh, diptych of, of Whitney and I, but I was counting recently, because it was a retrospective, so I saw 35 of my paintings dating back to the 80s in uh, this exhibition, and I counted how many times um, Jonathan has appeared in my work, you know, because... How many times, Joe? Okay, I, ca I counted... Um, I, I'm just talking about this in, in this last show in this exhibition. I know. was there. Yeah. So, um, but I didn't count. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna count backwards. So uh, the the most recent one being the the this miniature we were talking about. Um, then the uh, the giant my giant self portrait, um, which you appear in right next to William Blake. Um, 
the, the book of Revelations, and so that's, that's three. Okay, the, the book of Revelations, then um, the earliest, one of the most significant of our, of our beginnings as, as friends, uh, survival on the installment plan, which connects to scab vendor, you know, in many ways, even, you know, ways I didn't know, you know, until, until today. But um, that was four th that, um, that were there. But then there's the painting of Jonathan Shaw that I did that's in his home, which is five. But there was a couple more in, in your show. You oh, know. yeah, really? That I f maybe I've forgotten. There Remind was a couple more, but I can't remember exactly what they were, but there was a couple more. So well, there's probably like well, at it, least five just in your show. So I'm but it's a, significant, it's a significant place that he has in my life. I guess that, you know, is the thing that, that I'm struck by. And uh, I remember you talking about how we're, how we're bookends, and it... It never became more clear to me until I, I read Scab Vendor. And um, there's, there's such a way that Jonathan um, paints with words that, um, that blows me away, you know, that, that ca you know, captures me, you know, and takes me to, to all kinds of, you know, wonderful terrible like i could smell it i could you know i could feel it the textures the the colors you know and and that's that's rare for me and like i'm pretty hard on um <laughs> on writers and musicians and and even worse on fellow artists um the, <laughs> these um but these these words that um you know that fill these pages you know are you know, I, you know, I, or, you know, so moving to me. Like, a, um, like to start with, just, just I'm talking about in Scab Vendor, just a few that like, that started to get me going. I mean, I already was from the from the opening page and, you know, the beginnings of, you know, just the whole idea. It was like a movie, you know, a movie that's unfolding, you know, and. Here's this, you know, this young kid who's a fan, you know, visiting Jonathan, you know, who's, you know, a misanthropic, you know, <laughs> that really has no time for this kid that's never even had a tattoo in his entire life, you know, and that wants this giant back piece. And I've seen this before. I've seen, I've seen it, you know, while I was living in the, his tattoo parlor many, many years ago. I've seen this unfold before, but it became a wonderful way to tell this journey, you know, to, to have this innocent, you know, actually draw out this, you know, amazing confession, you know, that, that, that Jonathan in, in his courage, you know, and in his artistry really gives to, you know, to the reader. Uh, and I, it's, I mean, it's not just that that um, that you're my dear friend, but I I think you're one of our greatest writers, and and I, and I mean that. Well, coming from you, Uncle Joe, that is a great honor because I know how you know exigent you are. You know, I mean, you're, you know, you're very generous and very honest and very truthful and very much a giver in so many ways. But on the other hand, you suffer fools, you know, not at all. And, you know, I've seen you tear writers and musicians and especially other artists a new asshole, including myself. I mean, you know, when I, I, I've done a lot of painting in my time. And, you know, if it's something that Joe doesn't think highly of, especially, you know, in the visual sense, you know, he's just like, you know, merciless. He's like, that's fucking utter crap. You know, and I've seen that. So, you know, to receive accolades like that from, you know, somebody like Joe, I know he's not, you know, blowing rainbows up my ass, uh, you know, which makes it doubly a huge honor. So 
Thank you, brother. I really appreciate but it. But you, you absolutely deserve it, and I, I'm very, very proud of you. <laughs> Thank and, you. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you don't mind me, like, asking you a couple of questions b before... Please. Before they get to ask you a couple of questions. You know, there were things that, that I learned, you know, and I, you know, I thought I knew you pretty well. You know, but, um, I mean, that's true with, you know, with any kind of revealing art, you know, that, that you learn. You know, and... You know, this, even the, the writing you kind of kept hidden from me, you know, for many, many years. You know, I, I didn't realize your passion for writing, you know, until much more recently. I think you were maybe, <coughs> you know, embarrassed or, or shy. Well, I think I kept it, it hidden from myself for most of my life. And, you know, I only really, it was always important to me, but it was always something that I was kind of like, oh, don't go there because once you open that door, there ain't no turning back, you know. So for most of my years, you know, on this earth, I was like a scream looking for a mouth, but I didn't even know I was looking for a mouth. I was just screaming in, you know, a lot of very sort of dysfunctional ways until, you know, I, I made a decision that I was just going to pretty much abandon everything else and dedicate my life to, you know, storytelling and that, you know, I'd been working up to that all my life, but I didn't know it until about 20 years ago when I said, okay, that's it. You know, I'm, I'm quitting tattooing for the most part, and I'm, you know, I moved back to South America, and I just started writing full time, all day, every day. And, well, you know, until then, I was just like probably pretty much scared of what I knew would be required of me. For what you what you just said too about the scream too reminded me of um, when you and and I I assume that this is correct that this is Malcolm's writing about the scream. No, no. So that was yours actually. No, that's what that, I was that thinking actually was something. My one of my mentors was a guy named Cubby Selby, uh, known as Hubert Selby Jr. He was a good friend and he was a mentor for me. And he actually, that's, that's his catch line. You know, he used to just say in interviews, yeah, it was a scream looking for a mouth. But later on, I found, after he passed away, I actually found out that that, that phrase, he'd kind of copped it from another writer who also happened to be a mentor of mine when I was like a teenager. A guy named Harlan Ellison wrote a book called uh, Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. Right. And, you know, Harlan Ellison was this great science fiction writer, and I had the honor of, of knowing him pretty well when I was like, I don't know, maybe 15 years old, and I was just starting to write just weird, fucked up poetry, and he gave me a lot of encouragement back then. Uh, but what I was thinking, Jonathan, yeah. at the time, though, was, uh, you know, in, uh, in Scab Vendor, where it's the, the scream, and it's just, you know, y you... You know, it's around the time of uh, the, the, you know, the Manson murders, and there's that intense scream in, in the desert, and, and the oh, wonderful yeah, way it's described yeah, yeah, yeah. is so intense. You know, you can feel, yeah, you can feel the goosebumps, and you can feel, yeah. And you mentioned Malcolm, you know, but it sounded like from it was from you. The well, there's a connection. Yeah, and and it seemed. Well, the, uh, Malcolm is obviously, you know, another side of, of you. I mean, the, the, the uh, carry that weight a long time that, that you mentioned, you know, with Malcolm carries the weight through, throughout the entire scab vendor. So certainly th that, that scream um, is, is your scream. Um, but it's mentioned in, in that passage, though, as coming from Malcolm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Malcolm was my cousin who committed suicide pretty much right in front of me when I was 15 years old. And yeah, that was, you know, it just, it's kind of a metaphor for just the whole primal scream of just agony of the human condition, you know. But I mean, that's part of this story as well. 
And, mm-hmm. you know, the guilt and the shame that I carried just by being so close to him and not being able to prevent his destruction uh, is something that's kind of a theme throughout this book. Yeah. Spe- yeah, and I, I bet <coughs> that... That was the closest part. thing I had to a brother, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I, I felt it so much. And like you, you, you know, you, you as a little child. I mean, uh, yeah, as a child, you know, and and you like just crying for, you know, Malcolm, who's tripping. You, you know, you're both tripping on acid, and you're trying to get him, you know, f- from being grabbed by the cops, you know. And you're, you, I could feel your 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 pain and frustration. And, and guilt ever of even like leaving the scene when the cops got him too. I mean, I I could feel all of that, and then it, it you know it it was something that you had to carry throughout the rest of the book. Well, throughout the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least I'm talking about the book right now. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. But then him like you know dying from the the rat poison, you know, is it's pretty intense, you know, and I. You know, I've lost people like that too, and I know, you know, you can identify so, I mean, at least I can identify so much with um, with the people in, in your book, you know, and uh, these lives that, that you've touched, you know, but the lives that you've touched have also been um, interesting, I think, for for historical <laughs> reasons too, because you, you've touched on you know, not just the fact that, that your father was the king of swing and your mom was the queen of the bees, <laughs> but, you know, you're, you know, you're, st- you're like Connie's doing Elia Kazan, you know, who's one of the great directors of, you know, like uh, America's, um, you know, like the, all the great Brando stuff, the, you know, the, you hanging out with uh, Sam Peckinpah when you were a kid, um, the the Manson stuff. I mean, you you've led a, a life that kind of stitched to, stitches together, you know, a a part of like our generation. You know, that's that I've. I think it's even more interesting than our story, you know, of just our lives too. And uh, someone can can um, it's almost like um, you know you, you represent a little bit of of, uh, of that you know what we all went through. Well, I know? feel kind of like this story, you know, and I wrote a lot of this story in the third person, so as not to get too attached to my story because, you know, that could be a pitfall. So, you know, I had to, f- I had to find through literary devices a certain degree of detachment from my story so that I could tell the story, you know, with as much humor and compassion and sort of emotional detachment as possible. So. You know, in that, in that doing, you know, looking, trying to find a way to be as objective as possible about my story so that it's not my story anymore. So it's just a story that I'm trying to recount, you know, sort of like doing an archaeological dig into somebody's life and not feeling emotionally detached to that somebody like, oh, me, 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 you know, I, I don't. You know, personally, I don't identify with that sort of maudlin selfishness in a writer. You know, there's got to be a certain detachment in order to see things as they maybe really are, you know. And, you know, once you sort of remove your self emotionally from a story, you can look at the story somewhat dis- dispassionately. You know, I think you do that a lot in your painting. You know, I, I, I know you do, and, you know, that's that's a great inspiration to an artist like myself, and that's what I aspire to do, is be able to, you know, be, to delve into these really dark places without being affected by it in a way that, you know, might color my judgment 
in you know a, a, you know turn it into some sort of subjective fucking pity party or something like that because you know there's a lot of tragic events that I'm going into here and I don't want to be that guy who's like you know whining about anything you know because to me the life that one lives is kind of like a tapestry of you know people places and events that becomes like this incredible confluence of circumstances that if viewed dispassionately can be seen more clearly for what it is you know and can be seen with more compassion with more humor and i think detachment is really key for a writer especially when they're writing about themselves you know yeah, so no, no, you know it's it's real hard to feel sorry for yourself act, though too it's hard to feel sorry for yourself or proud of yourself or ashamed of yourself or any of those things for oneself when one sort of removes oneself from the picture and writes as if they're writing about some fictional character. So that's why the book actually reads like fiction, even though it's, you know, clearly a, a memoir. And, you know, to me, that's really important, you know. And, you know, I feel like with all these historical events and crazy people and places and things that I was involved with over the course of a pretty multifaceted life, I could sort of stand back in amazement and go, wow, you know, that shit actually happened wow that's that's pretty interesting that guy was a real lightning rod for all kinds of you know really momentous happenings but i don't have to feel too much attachment to that guy even though on some other level i was that guy and i am that guy so you know it's a, it's a you gotta you know kind of remove yourself step back and look at things from a distance to be able to actually go in there almost like a surgeon, you know, and, and you actually said it. You were the guy that yeah. said, like, I write like somebody vivisecting his own soul. And to be able to do that, I think you have to have that clinical sort of objectivity. And the only way you're going to get that, at least in my experience, is by, you know, letting go of your attachment to your story. Absolutely, yeah. And, and in fact, because, um, you know, no matter who... You know, in my case, you know, if I, when I paint a subject, which is, you know, could be a repre reprehensible person to, you know, to humanity, and I might even think that, you know, myself, but when I'm painting them, I can't think that. Yeah. I, ha I have to allow them to speak. I have to allow them to tell their story. I can't make any kind of judgment. Well, you know? in, that, in that sense, you know, I think... You know, artists, at least a certain kind of artists, like Joe and myself, you know, we kind of work in this medium, mediumistic capacity. Like we actually become sort of channels or mediums for other entities, which are part of us, but they're also other entities to come through and and tell their stories. You know, and there's a lot of there's a lot of dead people in my book. There's a lot of people in, in this book that didn't make it. And, uh, you know, those suffering spirits, I believe that, you know, they can take some comfort from the fact that there's somebody here in the material world being, allowing their, themselves to be used as a mediumistic channel through which their story can be told with compassion, without judgment. You know, I think that's really important. I think in that sense, it's almost like a, a work of charity that Joe certainly does and that I'm, you know, that I'm attempting through this kind of writing. So I think it's, you know, it, it goes a lot deeper than just me putting on my thinking cap and going, well, what am I going to say next? Uh, in fact, in, in my mind, it's you take off your thinking cap. Absolutely. Fuck it. Absolutely. I let my hand tell me what to do. You know, Jonathan, I think it would be a good thing um, to to read something for your book because it's so special. You know, I have uh, I have you on Audible, and uh, to hear Jonathan read his own his own writings. I mean, it reminds me of back when I when I knew William Burroughs. You know, and like to have 
to have him like read his own writings it's like it's such a pleasure you know and you know what i would like for you to read um because it, it really um it, it tickled me and it made me feel like um like my first days in coney island or in times square <coughs> it was when you saw your first tattoo parlor well that's a short that's I think that's a short, very short section, but I'll yeah, I'll, but I'll but I think it's good just for because the, the colors and the, and the just the feeling before you get busted for stealing the comic books. Uh huh. Okay, let me find that one. Do you want me to find it for you? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Sure. Let me. S- well, uh, no, well, you could, could you could find, find it, it better. I could yeah, find yeah. It faster because yeah. I did write it. Because you did write. It. <laughs> yeah. But uh, this uh, this to me is just like a a quick little like. I mean, I think it captures Jonathan's childhood and wonder, you know, and I think if we start there, it's kind of a nice way to, it was a nice way to, like, even experience Gap Vendor. You know, you're... Actually, yeah. I I loved it. If I read the whole chapter, it's probably not as short as I thought it was. Uh, Please do. Yeah, okay. And by the way, this, when they did this Audible, the Audible version of this book, I was really, I was really happy that they decided to let me narrate my own work because, you know, a lot of these audible.com situations, you know, they hire some cheesy actor to read a writer's work and you know, I just couldn't abide by the idea that somebody else was going to read my words. So, you know, I talked to my agent, and he was like, well, you know, they, they don't often let a writer read his own work unless it's, you know, somebody really famous like Deepak Chopra or somebody that sells a lot of, a lot of, a lot of print. So, you know, we'll present that option to them, but, you know, don't hold your breath. And... So I asked him to send them a few YouTube videos of me actually doing spoken word events because I actually do that stuff. I, you know, usually I'll I have a band behind me or something like that or some kind of musical accompaniment, you know, and, and people have told me, you know, it's kind of a really cool show. We're doing one tomorrow night, by the way, at uh, the Slipper Room. So if anybody's interested in coming to that, there'll be there'll be a there'll be some musicians behind me, and it's going to be a different kind of deal than just a straight book reading. We're going to have you know it's going to be a bit of a spoken word show, but anyway, so he sent them uh, those um, YouTube videos, and they were like, oh, this guy he's got a good voice, he can read. So let's yeah, so they actually hired me to read my own book. Thank God. It would be hard for me to picture anyone else. It would just be weird. It would be like, you know, having to s- sit there, stand there and watch some guy fucking your wife or something. It would be it would be rather uncomfortable for 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 me. So so thank God, you know, they did let me narrate the book and I, you know, spent like a couple of weeks in a recording studio and the thing was I I uh, Jim Jarmusch my dear friend Jim, he, he's got a little band and he's, he's been making music for his own films lately and he let me use some of his really weird, moody, evocative sounds that he creates as a background for the, uh, for the book. So when I was reading it in the studio, they did a playback and I got this weird sound stuff from his... Uh, his music, so I was reading to that accompaniment. I don't know, I haven't listened to the whole audio book, so I don't know how well they they were able to put that in with the, the reading. It's, it's pretty subtle. It's too subtle, I think. But yeah, it's too subtle. In, in my mind, you barely even hear yeah, it. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's what I got from the little bit that I heard. I was like, what the fuck, turn up the volume, man. Because this is some really, you know, it's important. You know, my father was, you know, was a genius musician. I've never, never played an instrument really other than my voice, but I have a musical ear. So when I'm reading to music, whether it's a band or whether it's, you know, live music or whether it's something like 
the stuff that Jim recorded, you know, it, it affects it affects the way I read. It affects the tone and the cadence and the rhythm of the words in a way that's like pretty, you know, pretty important. So, yeah, they kind of fucked that up. Uh, but, well, if anybody comes to the thing tomorrow, you'll see a different kind of reading than this. This is just... But, but still, Jonathan, I mean, you carry the book in a, a wonderful way. I mean, I still would suggest anyone to actually listen to it because, you know, he goes into these different characters. Like, he, he has the voices for, for his grandmother, you know, <laughs> you know and, and, and his, his mom, Doris, and, like, every, and Artie, and, like, all their voices come out, and it's pretty wonderful to experience. Well, thank you. Because, yeah, I mean, my mother was an actress, and my father was a musician, so I guess I inherited some of that. But your grandma cracks me up, because your grandma is, like, an exaggerated version of you. Yeah, she's kind of like a female Archie Bunker or something. Yeah, yeah, you know. but it sounds so much like, <laughs> like, like you want, uh, like as you said, like a Vic Tanny biker. She's like a Vic Ta Tanny biker version of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was a tough old bird, you know. And it was funny because Joe actually, I wanted Joe to read the book before we sat down here with some of these events. <coughs> And Joe, you know, has been really busy. I mean, he's a really busy guy, you know. I mean, when he's not painting, you know, eight, ten hours a day in his studio, you know, he's out, you know, promoting his stuff, showing it, doing all kinds of stuff, traveling around the world. So I was like, Joe, you got to read the fucking book. And he was like, oh, well, I'm, I just don't have time, you know. And I was like, well, oh. And then I, then I was like, wait a minute, there's an audio, audio book. You could sit in your studio and you could paint your paintings and listen to this thing. Because I know he listens to music all day long while he's painting, so I was like, listen to the book while you're painting, and that's exactly what he did. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right, so here we go. So this chapter is somewhere about halfway through the book, and it's called <coughs> Tattoos, and it kind of describes my first impression of, you know, my first sort of fascination with tattooing when I was about 14 years old. And, okay. And this is switches tenses as well. So this is, you know, gives you a little idea of how the whole book is written. Coming up for air from a sea of memory, Sigano. Sigano is my sort of literary alter ego. That's me, Sigano. Coming up for air from a sea of memory, Sigano sets his tattoo machine down on the table and throws the rubber gloves in the trash. He pulls a cigarette from the pack, lights up, and looks over at the kid. Have you written about how you first got into tattooing? Jocko asks. Funny you should ask that, man. He grins, lighting up. Must be all this tattooing's giving me ink on the brain or something. I was just going to read you this thing I wrote about my first real impression of it back in the 60s. As he stares into the page like a deep sea diver reading through a cloud of smoke, the words stir up a new flurry of memories. The first time he ever saw those mysterious little symbols that would someday make up the roadmap of his destiny. <coughs> this next part is him reading from his book in progress to this kid who's kind of asking him a lot of questions. 1965 was the year of the big Watts riots. I must have been about 13 when the ghetto exploded in the August heat. After charges of police brutality came to a boil in the hyper-segregated Los Angeles basin, Fierce rioting broke out in the all-black inner-city neighborhood. As the urban battlefields burned, panic swept the whole city. The news media fanned the smoldering embers of a long-standing racial mistrust into a full-scale black-white Armageddon. Television anchormen warned that the burning and looting could soon spread to white neighborhoods, an absurd notion since the violence was contained to a distant inner city slum far from the affluent suburbs. To make a perfect shitstorm worse, the racist police chief denounced Watts residents as monkeys in the zoo. 
adding new insult to decades of racially targeted cop abuse. Frank Zappa summed up my take on the whole racial tone of my country when he said, you know, people, I'm not black, but there's a whole lot of times I wish I could say I'm not white. In a media-generated tizzy, Len, my stepfather, Len, a bleeding heart armchair liberal who'd never had a black person in the house except to clean it, packed up the caddy and insisted we leave home. We drove to a quiet beachfront community in Malibu where he said we could wait things out safely in a small rented vacation house. This was right down the road from Doris's old theater mentor, John Houseman's luxurious beachfront mansion. The following weeks were a typical family disaster. Every night, Doris would get plastered with her theater friends, then come staggering back down the beach to carry on drinking alone and raising hell for the rest of the night. The beach house Len had rented was just a shack compared to home, where it was easy to avoid each other. Now we were forced into close contact, my worst nightmare. Seething with boredom and indignation at Len for sticking us in a pauper shanty, one night my mother got drunk as a fiddler's bitch. In a typical scandalous meltdown, wailing like an angry ghost, she tried to drown herself in the ocean. A couple of burly surfers jumped into the dark raging waters to fish her out, buck naked, kicking and screaming like a drenched wildcat. As I stood on the sand, cringing in, in embarrassment, Len looked on in silence, useless as a wristwatch on a sweet potato. I soon made friends with some kids from down the way and did everything I could to stay away from the house. <clears throat> we started hanging out with a hard-drinking, out-of-work movie director named Sam Peckinpah, who was spending the summer at the beach. Peckinpah, who would go on to direct classics like The Wild Bunch and Straw Dogs, was the kind of rugged role model my friends and I could relate to. We spent our evenings with him sitting around a bonfire, getting buzzed on his beer, while he delighted us with ribald tales of adventures in Mexico and the Orient. Sam was a kind of real man's man I'd always pictured my father to be, a polar opposite of my gutless stepfather. When Lynn got wind that his son was spending more time with this Peckinpah character than at home, he started a smear campaign to turn the other kid's parents against him, making up all sorts of evil rumors about the poor guy. It was like the doormat's revenge. After convincing my mother that Sam was a bad influence on her beamish boy, they slapped a chicken shit dust to dawn cur curfew on me. Bored and discontented, a few kids would meet up on the sly in the morning and take the big blue city bus down to this sprawling old amusement park, the Pike, by the port of Long Beach. That's where the cool kids hung out the tough kids, the troublemakers, the juvies. Disneyland was over in Orange County, a world of plastic white trash suburbs. Disneyland was for mama's boys and fairies. The Pike was more like it, a rundown time warp of blue collared factory workers, bikers, sailors, and drifters loitering on the hot summer boardwalk, smoking cigarettes and drinking beer from cans. One day I went down with another kid. After spending all our money on games and rides, we were standing in front of this dingy tattoo parlor, peeping in the window. A dusty ship in a bottle sat next to a stuffed weasel wrestling with a snake, and a blue and white statue of a sailor. The haunting little object seemed frozen in time under rows of faded old carnival photos of sideshow freaks tattooed men and women staring out from rusty cages of long ago. Hundreds of colorful little pictures like comic book panels covered the nicotine stained walls from floor to ceiling. An endless loop of pinup girls, skulls, daggers, dragons, shooting stars, crosses, saints, anchors, panthers, and goofy cartoon ducks. I was hearing jungle drums. It was like a religious experience a portal to another world, a familiar place I'd always known, deep in some lost, forgotten region of my soul's memory. 
I rose up on my tiptoes, focusing on a picture of a high-masted ship sailing through a colorful sea of naked ladies, tigers, anchors, horseshoes, mermaids, devils, and old-time cartoon characters. Every inch of space was covered with mystery and magic. I wanted access to that smoky other world. I needed to see all those tattoos right up close. My guts raged and my mind raced as I inched toward the door. My hand hesitated. Just as I worked up the courage to go in, I saw the little sign. You must be 18. I stood there frozen, the ominous words holding me at bay like a cross before a thirsty vampire. I moved back to the window and peered inside again, longing to know the secrets within. I could smell the soot on the ledge and my ears pounded with excitement. People were moving around in the back, sailors crowding around in a corner where a skinny old guy with bare arms covered in fuzzy blue-green hieroglyphics sat hunched over another guy. I could hear a muffled buzzing sound and I knew exactly what was going on. Nobody had ever told me about tattoos, but staring in that dusty window, I knew I needed one. The tattooed sailors were drinking, passing a little bottle around. One guy had this great big eagle with the ship covering his whole chest. I wanted to grow up real fast and be 18, to disappear into that smoky haven and never go back, to go wherever sailors sailed to, sailing off on a billowing ship of dreams across a painted watercolor horizon, far as a young boy's spirit could fly on a pair of fuzzy blue tattooed wings. As my breath fogged the window glass, suddenly a big hairy hand grabbed my arm in a vice-like grip. My heart froze as a booming voice bored into my ear. A stocky red-faced man with a crew cut stood towering over me yelling, Gotcha, you little turd! A group of bikers watched with amusement as my friend darted off into the crowd. A tall, lanky guy with a long, blonde, nicotine-stained beard stomped over, facing my stocky captor. Hey, man, give the kid a break. The angry shopkeeper ignored him, bending my arm back, growling. I saw you, you little bastard. As I struggled to break loose from his beefy grip, a stack of comic books slid from under my shirt and fluttered to the ground. As the man bent to pick them up, I broke loose and bolted. The biker who defended me extended a casual motorcycle boot, and I tripped and fell to the pavement. He turned away laughing as that huge hairy hand of guilt plucked me from the ground like a cat snatching a baby rat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and it, you know, it speaks to so much, too, you know, the, and I think a, a lot of people um, from, you know, not from our generation don't realize that, you know, tattooing was illegal, you know, for, God, in New York City, it was, tattooing was illegal when you were working here, and um, it was a very different time, you know, and it was... It truly was something, you know, that, you know, that was considered of, you know, the dark arts. Oh, I know the devil did it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, in a way, I even feel, you know, I miss those days, you know, when it, when it had that kind of mysterious, you know, um, you know, when Jonathan talks about, you know, he's reaching for the door, you know, <laughs> he just, you know, and he's been reaching for that his whole life, too, and and to reveal that, you know, that part of himself as a child, too, and I think it's wonderful, and, uh, you know, and, and I connect so strongly with that, you know, with, uh, with, it, with me, it was the um, P.T. Barnum's Museum, you know, and I, but I remember that very clearly and then eventually I had this my own museum <laughs> you know in my own home I recreated it but those things are so you know in your childhood are so powerful you know and I thought 
he's reaching back and what what a wonderful way to uh, to start you know this journey well, about I've a scab a, vendor yeah i've got a lot to say about the sort of decadence or the disappearance of you know magic in areas like tattooing that used to be this sort of weird marginal you know kind of scary art form that has now been sort of co-opted to the point where it's kind of this boring predictable mainstream thing you know i've got a lot to say about all that and i think i've said something about that in this book yeah, but, you have you know, but in a roundabout sort of way and there's really no time for that conversation now because we just got the we just got the we two got minute. The, um, we got the, the heave minute. ho. Yeah, we got the heave ho. So, <laughs> but but anyway, I we mean, we still got to sign a couple books here too. So, hey, thank thank you all. Sorry. <laughs> Questions? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, great, awesome. That's that's the fun part. If there happen to be. Are any. there any questions? <laughs> yeah, people are usually pretty shy at these things, but maybe we, you know, maybe we got to. Can I force people? <laughs> to yeah. Hey. There you go. How you doing, man? Hi. So I remember coming down to your shop. I got tattooed by you first. Wow. You got it on you? Yeah. I'll probably recognize the tattoo, and then I'll be like, oh, I know you. But I, w I don't remember faces because I'm always hunched over. It looks like almost 30 years ago, so. 30 years, damn. I was 20 years old. Cool. Um, so anyway, I was like, I remember going to the shop, and I remember like finding the number in the back of the village boy, calling you up, getting down to the East Village, they have to give you another call so that you know that it was like, oh, I guess I was serious. Did you, read, did you have a concern about at the time, like when you had this two, two step process? Of, I called them. Yeah, oh, yeah. Back. Yeah. I've come to the city, I'll call you again. Yeah, actually, the afterword of this book that's not written by me, it's written by a colleague that actually describes all of that. You know, it talks about in the afterword to this book, it's like 30 page afterward. It was supposed to be the introduction, and I was like, I can't put a 30-page introduction, so we put it in the, as the afterword. But it's cool because it, it actually goes into that history. Because this book, by the way, is just the first book of a series of five. And this pretty much covers the first 20 years of my life. And it's not, it's a little misleading because it says Confessions of a Tattoo Artist. And it makes some readers think it's going to be all about tattooing. And actually, there's very little tattooing in the first 20 years of my life. So it's kind of a foundation for the... I don't know, the evolution of a character, the tattooing comes in in subsequent volumes a lot stronger. So, so the afterward kind of takes care of that. So at least in the afterward, you know, there is a lot about the history of my history as a tattoo artist because the rest of the book, it's more of my history as a human being that later became a tattoo artist. But this book ends when I'm about 20 years old. Uh, that being said, yeah, you know, back in the day when this young man was getting tattooed there, you had to, you know, you had to, you had to call. I'd probably ask you to send me a deposit in the mail so that I know you were for real. And then once I got your deposit, I'd call you to set up an appointment. Then I'd tell you to go to the corner of like First and Bowery and call from the corner. And then I'd like sort of go down there in like a trench coat and sort of spy on you, make sure you were all right. And then I'd walk up to you and be like, all right, follow me. And we'd go into this sort of dark, innocuous looking boarded up storefront. And inside was this underground tattoo shop. And you know, my, it wasn't so much that I was afraid of getting in trouble with the cops, because tattooing was technically illegal at the time, I wasn't really worried about the cops. I mean, some of the cops were some of my best customers, but, so it wasn't that kind of thing, but it was like, kind of like that Lenny Bruce thing, you know? It's like, well, I may be paranoid, but there really was, really is people out to get me. And there was a lot of, you know, sort of underworld weirdness at the time, and there was, you know, sour grapes in the legitimate tattoo community over in places where tattooing was legal, like Jersey, Long Island, uh, you know, a uh, little north of here, outside of the five boroughs, there were legitimate tattoo guys who were, you know, paying rent and taxes and everything like that, you know, and had licenses on the wall. And they were like, you know, seeing that I was getting a lot of 
their customers, and they didn't like that. So there was death threats. There was there was a couple of drive-bys. You know, I, I was shot at. You know, so I you know I was kind of paranoid. You know, and I I usually wouldn't go out of the shop without you know carrying at least one gun and some other blunt object on my person. You know, it was a different scene. It wasn't like it is nowadays. It was almost like being a drug dealer or something back in the day. So there was, you know, so yeah, that was, I remember those those days. Boy, it's it's a different world now. The good old days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. You touched on the, uh, the subject of everything becoming mainstream and homogenized and sanitized and acceptable. And the world that you grew up in was so clearly set apart from mainstream society and now it's been absorbed and made into this ersatz reflection of what it once was. What do you see that having done to new artists and new writers in depriving them of that forbidden nature which sort of infuses your work? Well, that's a really long conversation, my friend. Uh, you know, but it's, it's kind of like you know, like I look out here and there's, you know, maybe a dozen plus of you guys, you know. And, you know, if it was, if I was some really mediocre shit-fed artist like Dan Brown, you know, there'd be a line around the fucking block, you know, to eat shit. And, you know, that's kind of reflected, you know, that's a reflection of, you know, the culture that we live in. And, you know, mainstream culture, you know, it's like, you know, I could go on and on. I mean, there's my brother artist Joe, and probably the greatest painter that ever fucking walked this planet. You know, and he's doing all right. You know, he is, you know, he lives comfortably. But I mean, you know, this guy paints for a year, eight hours a fucking day, you know, six days a week, you know, like a tradesman sitting there with a jeweler's loop on a ladder painting these meticulous, incredible, genius, visionary images and, you know, paints for a year and maybe gets paid, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Meanwhile, you've got painters who, you know, slap a few lines onto a canvas you know, in half an hour and sell that fucking abomination for twice that. And, you know, that's just kind of reflective of the culture that we live in, you know, and it just, it, it permeates everything. Mediocrity, you know, it's, it just permeates the soul of humanity. I mean, look at, you know, look at, we've got Donald Trump in the fucking White House, man. You know, the people are pretty fucking stupid, you know, I mean, as a whole. And, you know, that's reflected in, you know, our attitude towards the arts and our attitude towards the politics and just about everything, man. You know, it's like the way I see it, the artist is kind of like the, you know, the voice crying in the wilderness, you know, sort of like this, you know, Christ-like being, you know, trying to serve as the conscience of humanity. And he's basically, you know, pissed on and, 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 and disrespected and treated like a beggar, you know, whereas, you know, if, you, if you're if you selling shit by the pound, you know, there's going to be a line from here to fucking Madison Square Garden to buy it. And, uh, well, you know, this is kind of kind of tragic, you know. You got kind of got to laugh to keep from crying. <laughs> well, well, it reminds me, and you love quotes in your book, too. And I'm, I can't remember the, who said this, but um, I remember the wonderful quote, you might remember, if everybody likes you, you must be doing something wrong. Yeah, I don't know if that's a quote in the book or maybe it's just something that, I but mean. It's, I mean, I've heard it before. It, it just stopped. Well, if you're not pissing, but my, my, my quote, I'll quote myself, is if you ain't pissing somebody off, you're not doing a very good job of it as an artist. Yeah. I think it was uh, Jean, Jean Dubuffet that, that said, uh, when, I hear art, when I hear the word art, I grab my gun. <laughs> I used to wear a T-shirt when I was, you know, kind of the underground art guy, you know, in the Lower East Side. I used to have this T-shirt I loved. I wish I could find that thing. And it just had a, it had a revolver, 
you know, like a big, like 38 special right in the middle of it, and then it just said, kill all artists. And what was that great tattoo? Remember that? Yeah, yeah, I loved that one. It was a great shirt. And that, that old tattoo that uh, was pretty popular I, in the, the early 80s, it was, uh, well, no, nah, I wouldn't say pretty popular. Only like real losers got it, but it said, hooray for me and fuck you on it. Oh, I love that one. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that was my motto for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But so you guys want some uh, some books signed? I think. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks again for coming out. I really appreciate it.